Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, Peter's volunteered me to do most of the talking, um, since he wasn't all that happy to do the talking, <laughs> so that's fine. Um, just a bit about myself. Um, I've been I've worked out that I've been modelling for 66 years, so um, you know, quite a while. And um, I've actually got a photograph of me when I was 10 years old, sitting on a rug in Nairobi, in Kenya, uh, where I was brought up, um, building the Ravel steak truck, the Chevy steak truck. So that's 1959, 1960, when I was that old, yeah. Um, I've been building for a hell of a long time. Interesting enough, that Bukhara rug that I'm sitting on is actually on the floor of my current modelling room. We brought it out from East Africa with us and it's still sitting there, yeah. So, um, yeah, very uh, uh, linked to the past. Um, VAC forms basically mean you can get kits of things that you can't, well, you couldn't, and this is the problem, it's really in the past these days, that you really couldn't get um, normally. Yeah, sure. Okay, sorry. Muffle, muffle, muffle. That can be any... Maybe if I attach it to there. Sorry, I'm not used to this technology. <laughs> okay, there we go. Is that better? Is that any better? <laughs> maybe, maybe I'll just hold it. Um, okay, the... Um, Hang on, John Purcell knows exactly what we've got to do. Maybe I'll just hold it. Um, as I said, uh, back form kits were a way of getting all those sorts of things that you couldn't buy normally. But any of those of you who've been modelling for a long time probably know that you went through the stage of the Alan Hall method of cutting things out of balsa wood, sanding them smooth, and then coating them with... Uh, aircraft dope and talcum powder and then polishing that and then putting another coat on and so on. And um, several people also looked at plunge moulding, um, which I've used quite a bit um, to make fuselages. So this, this little Zaunkenig, for example, has a plunge moulded fuselage, as does the little Miles M1, where I, I carved a little balsa wood fuselage uh, to about 178 scale so that when you plunge the plastic over the top, you end up with something round about 170 seconds scale, and that's what those two are. Um, Brian, should we hold the background shutter down just a little bit? Yeah. Thank you very much, Brian. Okay. Um, Brian, 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 Brian. Thanks, Jerry. Um, uh, so, you know, we've, we've done all sorts of things like that, um, but uh, basically, the, the first commercial back, the first commercial back form kits were made by rare planes, and, um, Gordon Stevens from Rare Plains set that company up in 1969, basically because he wanted to get models of, of aircraft that he couldn't get kits for. And so he started off, and the thing that triggered him off was, as someone said earlier, the chocolate box. Um, and one day he was sitting at home in 1969 and saw one of these chocolate things and thought, I wonder how the hell they produce that. I can think I can use that to produce parts for a model. And so he um, investigated that and discovered they were produced by vacuum moulding. Uh, and he set up a very small vacuum moulding thing in his, in his cottage in England and sat there and produced kits. His very first kit was a Sversky P35. Um, originally, they were what's called um, male moulded. In other words, the, the, the model... Um, the, the plastic is drawn down over the top of a, a, a mould, the same way you do plunge moulding. And that essentially means that you don't get much detail. Um, he then discovered you could use the female moulded one where he would produce a master and scribe all the detail into it and then use that to produce a, a dished mould, which produced um, all, the, all the detail on the outside. And his very early kits were fairly basic, his, old, his later ones became extremely uh, sophisticated. Um, he, <coughs> so he did the, um, the Seversky P35, then he did the Curtis Shrike, and then the D510 and the Heinkel 51. He was thinking very carefully because he thought, let's get into the American market with the Curtis Shrike, let's get into the French market with the D510, and there's actually one over there. I've actually built one, and there's one sitting over there somewhere yeah, uh, along the back, I think it is, 
a Dewatin 510, the camouflage one, just behind the yellow sign. Um, and that's been produced from the, from the Rare Plains VAC form. Um, and of course, the Pico 51 um, was produced for the German market. Now, all of these kits are now available as plastic kits, but in those days, these things were cutting edge and they were pretty amazing kits. And I, I don't know, what was your first one? first one I made was the uh, big TU-20 MOS. Wow. Back in 76. And that's your first VAC form? First VAC form. Right, okay. <laughs> well, my first VAC form, um, and I've, many of these are quite old, but my first VAC form is the little Stinson Sentinel against the back wall there, and I built that in 1975, so it's, what, 39 years old yeah. or something. Um, and being my very first one, and some of you know that originally I was an AFV modeler, and I, I cocked that up something horrible. And uh, what do what do AFV modelers do when they make a mistake? They put a tarpaulin over it. And so that's ex that's that's exactly what I did with that little Stinson Sentinel because I made a mess of the of the um, canopy and the wing joint. I thought, well, let's pretend it's it's in the tropics, and um, we'll put a tarpaulin over that pit. And would you believe, 39 years ago, and that model still survives. Um, it has sagged slightly in the undercarriage, which is the reason why I've got a ladder running up to the top um, to support it. And you come up with all these ideas as you go along. Um, okay, so they were basically the, um, the, the first ones. Um, the, um, the swap to female type moulding, uh, back forming, took place about 1970. So he realised that after about a year or so that he would start to, he wanted the outside detail um, to show up on the fuselages and wings. Um, this, um, these, yeah, I mean, the Polycarpov um, I-153 and the Curtis CW-21 were his first female moulded ones. He later went back and re-engineered the other kits and they were also produced in female moulds as well. Okay, now from these humble beginnings, um, a plethora of companies got going, and um, you know you can see some examples of them here. Uh, there was Airframe, George Elliott, Air Models, Model Kit, and then in 1971, late 1971, Sutcliffe's Contrail kits kicked off, and we've got some great Contrail kits over there. I've got a few here. Um, I mean. <sighs> We still don't have a short sturgeon, so that's the contrail kit of the short sturgeon. Badly in need of a short sturgeon. Um, uh, we don't have a miles monitor. <laughs> Here's the miles monitor from from um, uh, from contrail. Now these kits were expensive at the time, um, but um, they were you know, they allowed you to produce a, a, usually a pretty accurate representation of the aircraft, um, and then and then. The Fairy Gordon was another one. Sorry. The Fairy Gordon was another one. And uh, I mean, they were fairly expensive at the time, but I paid a dollar for this <laughs> in a swap and sell. So, uh, so uh, but, and that was a couple of years ago now. So uh, there's been, there's, and then other companies came along with things like um, Phoenix, Former Plane, Joystick, Hallam Vac, and there's a little. Um, Osta 9 over there, that's a Hallam vac kit. They only produced about five kits, but they were really very nice. Um, uh, so there are lots and lots of things. And also some clubs got into moulding things as well. And the, the IPMS Stockholm Club in Sweden, they produced um, this little fellow, a little Miles, um, Miles Falcon. Um, I think they did a production run of about 200 of them for the club members because it was quite widely used in Sweden. So they, um, they produced a very crude set of moulds, but you know, it looks like a Miles Falcon, I'm pretty pleased with it. So that was that. The other thing that happened was, um, and I think um, we've got a couple of those here, the, um, uh, they started to produce uh, conversions. Uh, Falcon in New Zealand did things like, um, they did the two-seater, You've got one over there, haven't you? The two seater. Um... I've got the. There's a two seat uh, Meteor, yeah, and there's a two seat um, Fiat G ninety one. Yeah, and they were they were available then too. Yeah. Um, one of my favourite models, and it should be over there in the in the love thing, is is this one here, which is the Gannett AEW um, three, and that's produced by Aero Club. It's a it's a vac form fuselage um, added to some fairly heavily modified frog wings. 
um, and they produced that back in the late 70s. Um, and uh, the other thing about them, and, and this is what happened as a result of these kits, because they were, um, it was very hard to produce certain parts like engines, um, interiors, wheels. Uh, the wheels were invariably fairly crude. Um, and then a, a fellow by the name of an XRAF fitter by the name of John Adams set up Aero Club. And Aero Club produced squillions of parts. And so they were all, all like this. And so this one here, for example, is, the, is a Taurus engine. Um, they produced, uh, this is a, um, a twin wasp. Uh, I've still got these, would you believe? Um, Three dollars I paid for a seven-cylinder AS Lynx. Uh, they produce e um, exhaust pipes and all sorts of things. And, and um, here we are, is a, uh, a Merlin Merlin engine for a battle, I think. Uh, and um, he produced thousands of these things. John Adams is very, very unwell now, um, and uh, I think his production has been halted. Uh, but apparently, he still occasionally stuff out um, all in white metal and if any of you want to pick up this gannet you'll realize that weighs quite a lot it's, it's full of white metal bits and pieces that um, I uh, that I've added to the interior of it but I, I, these these sort of conversion kits like uh, Peter's um, Meteor and, and Fiat you know they're, they're, they're great they're just straight plastic yeah that's yeah, right yeah. Um, Okay, so, um, you know, Air Club came along to do that. Falcon came in with their canopies, um, and many of you are familiar with those, those, those canopies, sorry, I put it underneath there. Um, they're very familiar with those, and there are numerous sets of those. You'll notice that Peter and I are only talking about the one true scale here. Um, you know, it's all 170 second scale, which is our particular um, favourite. And um, so those, but... But there were also people producing 148 scale one. Dynavector is probably the best known of the of the 148 scale thing, and I could think Combat and um, some other company. Uh, in, ID. ID. That's right. Company. ID produced things in 30 second and uh, 148. Mm. There's a chap on Brit Modeler who has spent the last seems like 22 decades building a 130 second scale short um, sterling from a 130 second scale kit and um, I think the final photograph of it was finished and this thing would have been I think two and a half meters wingspan and two and a half meters long or something like that massive kit um, and he's he's built that himself um, from the ideal combat combat kit um, the first biggie in 170 second scale was the Constellation. Uh, Rare Plains put that out in 1975, um, and after that they produced all sorts of things. But it was real Contrail, wasn't it? Contrail started the, the big ones. So they went into the bigger ones, um, along with um, oh, what's his name? With the Moss. That's right. Yeah, they nice. did the uh, Moss, the Badger, the Bison. Um, they did the Starlifter. Uh, C124 Globemaster 2. You're getting into serious territory when you yeah. start building yeah. back forms that size. Um, and also they got in, and um, Peter's got a couple of examples over there of the biplanes, the interwar biplanes, mm. the big biplanes, mm. and Contrail started into yeah. those. I, um, well, nearly 20 years ago now, mm. did their Heracles, um, which uh, Frank Morgan generously devoted two magazines to in, in his model art magazine. There's a couple of magazine articles about my Heracles that um, some of you might be familiar with from about 10, 12, 15 years ago. Um, and that was my my first big one and, and my last big one. Um, you my, also got the Masochist Award. I, I got the Masochist <laughs> Award. <laughs> Thanks to Peter and his Masochist Awards. Um, and the largest back form I've built since then is the Hendon over there. Um, and uh, I haven't gone any bigger than that. Um, I find that they get a bit, bit, bit big. They make a hell of a mess when you're producing them. I and that's, that's probably why... Peter and I are not actually going to demonstrate exactly how we do things, simply because we're going to turn this place into a charnel house with plastic scrap. <laughs> um, okay, um, now um, Gordon Stevens ran into some problems with his company um, in that uh, a fellow by the name of Vane, V A G N, uh, decided to buy some of his kits and he started to produce 
injected molded kits based on those kits. He took the parts and he turned them out and he sold them under the V-Day and Merlin brand. And some of you who know V-Day kits and Merlin kits know that they were extremely crude because they were just copies of the, of the vac form kits. Um, Gordon took him to um, court and, uh, and won. Um, but, uh, and Vane himself was jailed, but not for copying back form kits, but because he was actually producing false credit cards and, um, and passports. So they jailed him for that, and um, nature had its, had its um, uh, retribution on him because he passed away shortly after getting out of jail. So um, that, was, that was the thing. Um, now, the other thing was, of course, that... Um, uh, in the United States, we've got a, a whole lot of companies coming out too. So esoteric, Executiform, Libra Models, um, and then we also had the American companies Combat and ID. Uh, a late arrival on the scene was Main Track Hobbies, and Main Track Hobbies um, used as their um, uh, what do you call it? Their, their um, inspiration came from this book by Barry Highgate, and uh, it's, a, it's a fabulous book, basically looking at British aircraft that rarely flew, and uh, they produced a whole lot of those. They were experimental aircraft, um, and they uh, they produced a whole range of them. So um, some of them did fly, uh, and so here's a kit of the Hilton Pool 120. I've got another kit here of the De Havilland 108, um, and they were reason, you know, even though they're, they're just in a plastic bag, I love the very first Airfix kit, but there's all the parts on a single sheet of plastic. But the innovation that they made was to um, follow on from Contrail. So it's not really an innovation. Um, it's just something they did because they took their inspiration from Contrail. But they included white metal bits for the undercarriage, the ejection seats, um, and any little doodads that, that, that couldn't produce well enough in vac form. And uh, they did a great job. They started off using those press fit decals. And if you look carefully at a couple of mine over there, particularly the, um, the Hanley page 115, um, all the decals are curling up because the, the glue simply didn't hold them on. And, and one day, one day, you know, it's all blue colours, know what that one day is going to be. I'm going to have to strip all the decals off and put um, uh, uh, water slide decals on them. Um, but uh, have, you, have you had it? And that Contrail never had decals, did they? No, no. none whatsoever. You had no. to go through your spares box. To yes, them. yeah. And, and, that's, and that's one of the things you do need when you do vac form modelling. You need a pretty good spares box for cockpit interiors, wheel well details, undercarriage and things like that, or you buy the kits that have got the parts. Now, the thing is that um, gradually vac form kits have disappeared. Uh, I, don't, I think there's only, to my knowledge, there's only two companies producing vac forms in the world at the moment. Um, and one of them is Key Car in Alaska, who produce um, some rather gorgeous kits. This is a key car kit of a Cessna 180. Um, and uh, the great thing about this kit is you can produce the one that's used by the Australian RAAF, and, the, and sorry, the Army, Australian Army. Um, beautifully produced kit, beautifully produced kit. Um, but no metal, just a single sheet, and there it is. Um, uh, one of the cruder manufacturers of, of kits was a company called Airframe in Canada and they produced the weirdest and most wonderful kit at, at, an, at an enormous rate when they could churn them out at about one or two a month but um, they, were, they were nail molded um, so that as you can see the, the outside of the, of the thing is quite r rough the inside is quite quite you know nicely <laughs> nice and sharply done um, which is very difficult, but um, let's face it, yes, just about. Um, and uh, the, the amazing thing about them is that uh, um, they were, uh, they produced the most bizarre things. Um, if you want a model of the Pterodactyl 1 or the Pterodactyl 4, um, Air Model do one. And um, so, in fact, I think, have I got one here? No. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, I haven't got one here. Um, but they're, they're totally flexible because they're, they're done on such thin sheets that, they, that they're totally flexible. And that, and that raises the, the issue of construction of these things. Um, I've got a couple of air model kits, the, the little um, uh, Compass Swift, and, no, the Compass Swift's an air, air club model, and the little, um, 
new goal, a little little new goal there. That's that's an air model kit, um, and uh, I found that anything that's a big kit is very very difficult to put together because they're so flexible, uh, and that is one of the issues with vac form kits. The bigger you get, the more flexible they get, and so you you face issues to do with that. Um, the only other company that's now regularly producing um, uh, vac form kits is Broplan, Broplan in Poland. And they are churning the kits out, and they they are really quite beautiful. Yeah. Um, I've got one here. Um, some of you know, or David does particularly. Dave Richardson knows that I have a predilection for weird and wonderful aircraft, and this is a Duatine three three eight, um, which was an aircraft produced in fair numbers and used a lot through from about nineteen thirty seven to the nineteen fifties. Um, it was a three engine airliner carried between 15 and 22 passengers, depending how squeezy they wanted to be. Um, Charles de Gaulle had one as, as his personal flight um, during during the Second World War. Yeah. So that is why it has such a long nose. <laughs> um, so, and, and they are they're, they're, they're lovely kits in the sense that, you know, here are all the parts. And you can actually see the first step in making a back form is to go around the parts with a pencil, a very sharp pencil. Um, and I've done that with those. Um, and later on, you can come and have a look at just how lovely the surface detail is on these. Um, and uh, Broplan also produce injected moulded engines, undercarriage bits, um, uh, instrument panels, propellers, and things like that. Um, and uh, but they're not cheap. Um, I think that was seventy odd dollars for for that for that kit. But uh, produces a model about the same size as a Wellington. Um, and uh, but it was an aeroplane that I always wanted to build, uh, and when I when I launched into it, I discovered the wonders of the internet um, on hyperscale and Brit model. I put out a, a plea because I discovered that Wingmasters magazine, which I think is one of the best aircraft modelling magazines in the world, um, had done a series on it back in the 1990s. And um, I said, you know, has anybody got a copy of these and can send me the photocopies? And would you believe that someone actually downloaded the whole article? Um, it's all in French. Um, fortunately, I can read French, but the whole article's got, um, you know, how he built it, um, uh, models of it, you know, finished, a um, whole lot of, in, of photographs, um, and a set of, set of drawings as well. So the internet's a wonderful place for modelers. You can get all sorts of stuff out there. So um, that's, uh, you know, there's nice interior drawings, um, seating arrangements and things like that. So, um, you know, that's, that's, that's what I will launch into one day. Um, okay, now, building the model. You've actually started one there, haven't you? I started, started one of the VFW 614. Fortunately, um, their model, they give you a reasonable set of instructions how to start off. And you get your construction plans, and on the back you get how you finish it. In this case, it's going to be a Luftwaffe one. So I started by cutting out the two fuselage halves and the wings. I kept everything all the offcuts because I use them to make uh, uh, oh, what do you call them? Bulkheads. Bulkheads. <laughs> yeah, I use them to make bulkheads. So you keep all your, it comes in very handy and also your tabs. So when you join the fuselage halves together, you automate your tabs like, um, like a zipper. Uh, yeah, put one here, one there. So this way, when you put it together, it gives it your strength. And the bulkheads give you the strength of the fuselage, because otherwise they're very flexible, very flimsy. So do you have a bit on how to actually shape the bulkheads so the right shape and size? Fortunately, he gives you the... Oh, he does, does everything for you. Otherwise, you go something like this or and this is another thing that I use yeah. on smaller ones when I'm trying to use bulkheads is I use lead wire and um, you can push the lead wire into the fuselage um, easing it in as close as it'll go um, 
And then when you take that out, you've, you've roughly got the profile. You can transfer that onto a sheet of plastic. Um, yeah, and this gives you the same kind of thing. Same sort of thing. Um, it's, it's, it is pretty important to keep the plastic um, because uh, vac form plastic is quite different from polystyrene yep. plastic that kits are made of. And um, the only glue you can use is the old tube cement yep. or um, the or Lavelle contactor. contactor. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Under no circumstances use Tamiya um, liquid glues, otherwise, you'll end up with a molten mess um, very quickly, believe me. <laughs> Ask me how I know. Um, but uh, the, the, um, the other thing to do is when you're actually separating the parts from the from the back sheet, um, as Peter's, Peter's got the, the bits and pieces there, um, I use a pea cutter. So um, Peter's got a slightly up, 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 up market yeah. pea cutter. Um, and you just run that around. So uh, let's, let's say I was going to use this thing here, and you're going to have to rely on the, on the oh, thing. Yes. Okay, so, and I would simply run that around very lightly the first time. Like that. And you'll notice it's about a 45 degree angle. And then, and then you do it heavier and heavier and heavier. And I'm going to make a hell of a mess up here. But once you've gone round a few times, interesting enough, the scurf you get off my pea cutter makes really good um, cables in, you know, for, for um, headphones and things like that in, in 48 scale. <laughs> okay, so once you've, once you've, once you've got it uh, to a, um, a, a reasonable place, you just snap it out. Okay? And that's usually the most terrifying thing for most early modelers to do. Um, but it just snaps out. Mm. And by cutting it in at 45 degrees, you've only got a small triangle of plastic on the inside there to remove. Yeah. Um, and um, which good WD for um, wet and dry paper. And and do it wet and use soap on the paper. Yeah. Well, like your luck luck soap. Luck yeah. soap. Yeah. You wet it, put the wipe it over with the luck soap because that acts as a lubricant also stops the paper from getting clogged up. Yeah. Because when you're rubbing it, you've got to eat. This is not. You've got to clean it right back until you get the uh, exactly level with what's on the fuselage. In yeah. other words, all this here has got to be removed. So you've got to get it flush with the actual fuselage or the wing. And I, I always start off with automotive rubbing um, paper first, aluminium oxide paper. Um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'll speak into my tailpipe. I'll, I'll, I'll speak into my tailpipe. Um, uh, but I, I start off with a fairly coarse grade automotive cutting paper, um, which you can pick up fairly cheaply. And I think Peter will agree as well that we yeah, like. Just like the. Um, Straight wet and dry, you get from Bunnings. Yeah. I start normally start off. What's this? Two forty. Yeah. yeah. So if it's a big, heavy, thick one like the yeah. Moss was, I started off with eighty. Yeah. So, that was the because that was very, very thick yeah. plastic. Uh, I, so I had to take quite a lot of it in one hit. <laughs> I, when I was doing the Heracles, would you believe, I actually used eighty paper, which is this stuff here. And I mounted it in my orbital sander and put my orbital sander upside down in my vice, and I went. Mm. That was a mood, and um, it took it took a lot of plastic off. Very quickly. Oh, well, yeah. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> so it's quite coarse, but it's it's a quick way of getting it off. And then you work your way through to the light bits. Um, now I don't know what Peter does, but when I've finished with the with the wet and dry, and a really critical thing is under no circumstances lick the wet and dry. Um, some of you may have seen the article that came out from. Um, uh, Mark Davies in Auckland, who's a IPMS uh, member in Auckland, he has Parkinson's disease and he has recently discovered that the microparticles in polystyrene are one of the contributing factors to Parkinson's disease. So don't lick your um, your wet and dry. And he was a wet and dry licker for, for, <laughs> for, for, for all of his modelling life. And he's, he's a couple of years older than me, but he's been modelling a long time. And uh, he actually put out a warning that went out to hyperscalers anyway about please don't lick your, your wet and dry. That's it may be too late. That's why you always do it wet. Wet. Always do it always wet, wet and have a bowl of water mm -hmm. handy and with soap. 
sunlight, sorry. Yeah. Um, now, once the other, the last thing I do is I always run the parts over the coarse paper anyway, because it gives a little bit of tooth to the plastic when you when you join them to get something for the glue to attach itself to. Um, and uh, I found that if you make the parts very smooth, then the glue doesn't quite do its job as quickly as it can. But doing those little zipper bits um, is, is a good thing to do. And, and you always use the same plastic that your model comes on because they are the same and they're going to bond easily. So, so, so what I've done is cut little strips about three mil wide. And from this, I will cut little sections and I'll glue them alternatively along the fuselage halves, which are these two halves here. This is the butterfly wing scimitar um, prototype. And um, so I will glue those alternatively along there. What I usually do is I, I cut the piece out and mark them with a pencil. So I know which ones to put on each side <laughs> because there's nothing worse than going, oh bugger, I've got two, two, two on the same side. So um, that, that's what you can do. With a wing. So, sorry, yeah. On a few sides that big, yep. how many tabs would be? I would probably put them interlocking because that's a very, very flexible fuselage, like, as you can see. More yeah. than area. Yeah. And, um, the, and, and this one comes with bulkheads as well. There's bulkheads mm. on the instruction sheet there uh, to cut out. Um, but um, uh, the other thing to do when you are um, sanding them, you'll get to a certain point whilst you're sanding that suddenly a little, a little film of plastic starts to come away. And that means you've met, you've got to the right spot when that little piece of plastic comes off, because that is exactly where the manufacturers intended you to sand back to. Um, I never cut, cut the cockpit open when I'm sanding the fuselage halves. You never do that first. You always do last. Last, last thing you do is to put that before you add the interior. And this kit comes with um, uh, it comes with. You know, bits and pieces to make the interior up um, and, uh, and unfortunately this one also comes with a lovely yellowed canopy so I'm going to have to, to plunge mould, I'll pl plunge mould a clear canopy to fit this one when I eventually finish it. I started this about five years ago, one day I'll finish it. Um, with wings, um, when you're sanding wings now, this is starting to look like my modelling desk at home here. Um, with wings you want to you want to sand the you want to sand the trailing edge down as fine as you possibly can, almost translucent, um, and make sure that you sand back from the trailing edge too. So use a, a curved blade. Oh, that's not right. There we go. And it doesn't matter how old your blades are, this one, but you make sure you're sanding, carving well back from the trailing edge. Otherwise, you end up with. A, an open edge along the trailing edge. And, and then if you want to glue that down, you've got to clamp it down and that throws the whole wing out of shape. Um, that's, yeah. uh, that's an unsanded wing. Yeah, so, so yeah. And you can see, you can see how thick the trailing edge is. It's about a millimetre and a half thick. And you've got to get that down to a feather. And um, what you do, and the best way to do it, you probably work, how do you, how do you hold these parts like that? And unfortunately, I've left a bit behind, but I make little loops out of, out of masking tape. Yep. And, uh, and I put a whole series of them along so I can hang onto it and sand backwards and forwards. I also attach my um, sandpaper to a sheet of glass with double-sided sticky tape. Um, and uh, that gives you a, a large, and you can actually buy rolls of wet and dry as well from automotive places because they use great sheets of the stuff so you use a big big roll of it and uh, that works really well um, just to show you how these these a model kits um, and how um, basic they were again you know the the, all the good details on the inside of the parts um, but uh, look how flexible they are <laughs> okay so that's certainly for the big ones, and I suppose, Peter, did you use spars on yours? Uh, basically, yeah, yeah but yes. something like this, I won't. No, no. Because it, it's a reasonably rigid plastic, it's not as flexible. Yes, yeah. yeah. But I, I will, I'll put a spar in there out of um, Albion Alloys brass, yeah. brass rod or something like that, uh, just super glue it inside there, uh, just to give it some, um, some strength, otherwise it's going to flop around and do all sorts of things. Some manufacturers like Formaplane and Esoteric 
give you single surface wings, um, which gives a model, you know, for particularly for biplanes and things like that, a lovely sort of light, light appearance. So, for example, this one here, the little Henrio, that's they're just single surface wings, um, and they, uh, I, I think, you know, and they, this thing weighs about the same as a five cent piece, uh, very, very light, and. Uh, um, so, you know, that's, a, that's a, a cute little thing you can get, just sur single servers. And there are um, a couple of models over there with the um, uh, Fairy 3D with the, uh, three, three with, the, um, with the blue stripes on it. That's got single surface wings. Um, uh, I think that's probably the only other one there with the single surface wings. Um, so they're, um, yeah, so they're great. Now, what else was I going to blather on about, you know? Just drift, drift away if I'm boring you. Um, um, yeah. Um, uh, tools, profile gate, lead, yeah, sure. Oh, okay, transparency. Um, uh, those of you who have ever bought a, a model which has got a back form transparency, you know, some, some people get quite horrified at the thought of trying to cut those out. I've, um, I've got a couple of tricks. One, put it in slightly warm water for a little while. Just, just not enough to make the thing fold back into a flat sheet, but just, just enough to warm it up slightly or sit it in a warm place in the house, uh, not in direct sunlight, but somewhere fairly warm. And, and then cut it, cut it basically out with a pair of sharp scissors. And I use children's nail scissor, scissors, um, which, are, which are incredibly sharp. Um, or, if, and if you've got access to these, I, my friendly doctor gave me these. These are single-use surgical scissors, um, and uh, they just throw these out. Um, and so if you go and see your doctor, anything with blue paint on it is, is expendable and thrown out after its first use. Um, and uh, it, again, incredibly sharp to a lovely fine point. And you cut around from the inside. So if I can get that nice yellow canopy there, um, okay, so I've got to do this under the camera, apparently, so I'm going to do that, um, and I should probably put my really strong glasses on. Um, nah, no, I'll just make a mess. No, I won't. I'll put my really strong glasses on so I can really see what I'm doing. Um, so so I, I, I'll cut the thing out just fairly basically from the outside, like that. Look at your plated breath. You've never seen anybody cut out a canopy before. <laughs> okay, that, and then I work from the inside. So I hold it this way, and I work from the inside. And if you do that, you, you can actually follow the exact line of the, that the manufacturers intended you to follow. You get to, there's actually a little ridge. You just cut around there like that. Okay, you missed a little bit, and you can feel the ridge by running in. Actually, I haven't. It's perfect. Um, and you just uh, so you go around from the inside and not the outside. So that's a that's a trick I learned many years ago um, when I was when I was doing these sorts of things. Um, and I found I, I hardly <laughs> hardly ever make a mistake with that. So you cut the thing from the out the inside rather than the outside, um, and uh, that seems to work quite well. And I'll I'll make a new canopy because that one's not going to be much use. It's gone yellow. Um, what else? Also, you're saying this wing spars. There's yeah. another company now, Titan Models. They're doing a model of the KC30, as used by the RAF and the RAF, in 72nd in uh, white metal, res uh, 3D printed resin, and the fuselage and wings are all in quite thick 20 thou inject on back form plastic. Right, yeah. And they give you everything, including a wing spar. And all this to put through for the wings so he can keep everything in place. Yeah. Um, okay, so, and, and then once I've done the canopy like that, I will dip it in future, because we've just got, we've got a little bottle of that. Yeah. Um, but I use, um, I use stuff called Crystal Windows that I think is made by S SMS or someone like that. A little jar of that. Sorry? M Mike, is it? Oh, sorry. Okay, sorry about that. I thought you were calling me Mike, but my name's Graham. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, Peter. <laughs> Is this really going to be recorded? <laughs> um, 
Uh, yeah, there's, there's uh, I think it's made by SMS, and it's a, a clear, they call it clear glass or glass clear or something like that, and you just dip your, dip your canopies in that, and it comes out very, very glossy. Um, you know, a perfect, perfect gloss finish. And then, of course, you shake the excess off, sit it to dry somewhere, and then put it on. And I, I find that works really well. Um, nearly all of my aircraft have had their canopies dipped that way. Um, although, now that we've got future, that's, that's a, you know, a great way to treat them. Um, and then I attach them with PVA um, or canopy glue, which is just super, super duper PVA. Um, and, uh, yeah. Basically, that's, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. That's about it. Yeah. Oh, apart from when you, if you're doing rigging a biplane, oh, in the yes, old yeah. days, it was a, no such thing as the easy line or anything like this. It was a case of taking a sprue, cutting your pieces off, candle, lighter, heat it up. Mm -hmm. Just you pretend that to be the sprue, then you hold your sprue over. The candle flame until it really got soft and melted, mm. and then you had a good stretch. Mm. Yes. You could stretch it out really mm. beautifully yeah. thin. Yeah. yeah. And if you want it thicker, it depends on how how much you pulled it out. Yeah. Demo, <laughs> just, just, just show it. Show it. Anyone not seen um, sprue being pulled? No. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, produce it. Now, I, I, you, if you look at my biplanes, all of the ones here, they've, they've seemed to have very shiny rigging, and that's because I use Albion alloy silver nickel wire um, to, to rig my planes. Um, I started off using the 0 0.1 um, millimeter stuff, and it's just too flexible. Uh, so I use the 0.2 now, and um, all of these have been rigged with 0.2 silver nickel alloy. Um, wires, um, which Dave Richardson managed to in empty an entire shop <laughs> for me, because it's pretty hard to get. And um, there was a shop in Barrel, yeah, in Barrel, that had three packets of, of one metre length. So I, we bought a lot. <laughs> so I've got about 15 metres, I think, of the stuff now, which is enough to do a few biplanes or maybe one uh, Singapore. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, yeah, the only disadvantage with using sprue, you can't put it on where it's nice and tight. You've got to put it on. So you've got a little bit of left uh, flopping around. So what you do is you use one of, one of these. And just get a, a end red hot yeah. and run it up and down and the heat brings it from there straight yeah. towards it. tight. It's exactly. nice and tight. Yeah, it's, it's really good for that. It's yeah. the only, only way you can really get a nice tight rigging mm. on a biplane yeah. or when you use a stretch sprue. Mm. That's right. Um, you know, and things like, you used to use black cotton and run it through a candle to make it wax and things like that. Yeah, we've gone past that stage, I think. But look, don't be afraid of platforms. As you can see, there's an enormous variety of them. And the great thing about them is you can pick them up to cheap and swap themselves because no one wants to build them anymore. But it's, it's a way of extending your skills. Um, you know, I love, I've built 30, I think, 30, 35 platforms. Um, and I've got another 18 to go in the stash. So, yeah. <laughs> Many of which are started because I, what I do is when I go on family holidays, um, we usually stop somewhere where I can have a have a little bit of quiet time and um, sit out on the balcony over the overlooking the ocean and um, reduce a kit to its parts just by um, yeah, taking all the parts off the backing sheet and letting the letting the cleaners clean up after me. <laughs> yeah, so, so it's good fun anyway. So, are there any questions? Um, not, much uh, longer. not much longer, really. Once you've got the parts cut out, it's basically exactly the same. Well, not exactly the same, but it's very similar to, a, to an injected moulded molded kit. Um, the only thing, the, the big difference is that you've got to scratch build the interiors because they just don't provide you with enough. Um, um, many, many of these kits... Yeah, like this one, it gives you a drawing of how, what size you 
to build everything, how many to build, how to lay it out. And mm. otherwise, it's all potluck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but and they give you the bulkheads, they show you how to lay it out, and they give you the floor plan for the seating. Show you how to make everything. Um, with with perfectly circular fuselages and, and many commercial airlines have got circular fuselages, I use a compass cutter. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen these. Um, it's made by Alpha. Um, you just work out how, let's say it's a um, 20 centimetre circular fuselage. You just set this at 10 centimetres, stick it in the plastic, twitch it around. There's a very, very sharp blade there and it'll cut a perfect circle out of the plastic. Um, and uh, and, and I, often if it's thick plastic, I'll flip it over and do it from the other side and uh, you end up with a perfect circle, uh, exactly the right diameter that you need. Um, I've, uh, I've got a few perfectly circular aircraft. I, um, I built the um, Albatross, the, um, uh, it's a, an article in um, Scale Aircraft Modeler a few years ago, in fact, 24 years ago, would you believe it? Um, and that's my article that I wrote about it, and it's got a perfectly circular fuselage, so all the bulkheads were cut out using that. Um, and uh, yeah, very, very handy. Yeah. Any, anything else? But you're more than, more than welcome to have a good look. And ask questions and like. Yeah, sorry. Yes, yeah. very much the exercise in masochism. My 170 seconds every week. That's right. Yeah. We've been working on for about, I don't know how many years or something. Come and have a look at it. And it's solid enough that everyone's about to dig around and bits. And it's got five apples for 20 carriage and four. Right, yes. Yeah. And the kid is probably at least 15 or 20 years old. Right, yeah. We've been working on it for about. Yeah. Yeah, well, many of these models are more than 20 years old. And as you can see, they're quite robust. They haven't um, haven't come apart or anything like that. So, and most of them have just been sitting on a shelf in a cabinet. So, yeah. Describing tool is not an ordinary It's a it's a it's a pre-cutter. Yes, it's, it's, it's a pre-cutter. Yeah. Yeah. Pre yes, yeah. And the, the advantage of a pre-cutter is that it cuts a, a V-shaped groove in the plastic, but doesn't leave an edge. So you don't end up with a scurf line. If you've got a sharp blade and ran it across plastic, it leaves a, a line on either side, but the pea cutter takes that out. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the, yeah. From Peter Shum, yeah. Or, and they're probably going to be far more expensive, you can get them at um, the ladies' um, Micro 10 spotlight. Spotlight sell them as well. So, yeah. That's how they cut. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I, I use these for um, scribing lines uh, or cutting panels, all sorts of things. Yeah. Excellent tool. And it comes in, inside the handle are uh, probably another 15 spare blades. Yeah. Really, really good tube. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Oh, pleasure. Nice, pleasure. Yeah. 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 Yeah.